Hi, I'm Brad. I'm Don. Right. So, um, I think we've actually covered little bits of this video in other videos. Okay. Uh, because this is a video compilation from uh, Recollection Road. Okay. At least I hope it's from Recollection Road. If it's not, we'll find out really quickly after I hit play. The correct information will be in the description below. Yeah, the, the information is correct in the description below. Um, it's because I don't have it uh, written on the video here. That's why. Uh, it's been titled, Unusual Car Features from the Past. Okay. Hyphen video compilation. Because obviously it's, it's stuff that's been mentioned in, you know, other videos and things you know so i'm like oh things from the 60s and 50s and 70s so he's combined them all into one so we may have bigger video reacted to yes of videos that yeah some we, of these yeah, yeah so already. probably on the music reaction channel where most of these videos still technically it's are go find them in, in our the playlist nostalgia playlist yeah. over there um hidden in amongst there is probably chunks of this video but this, you know, figured instead of, you know, trying to find chunks, you might as well watch the whole thing. That's okay. Yeah, it makes sense in my head at the time. That works for me. Well, before we get going, make sure you hit that like and subscribe. And check out the description below where not only is the link to the video that we're about to watch and the channel that it came from, which is probably Recollection Road, there's also links to our social media, the other channels on YouTube, which, as I said, music channel, there's a nostalgia playlist in there. Um, and quizzes and um, also and <laughs> yeah I guess there is some music in there too and also if you want to help the channel out then there is the Patreon the uh, wish list, and the so, other store where there's Gen X merchandise yes. Gen X related merchandise so. well there's also some Gen X merchandise with that well, logo yeah, on it I guess that's <sighs> okay all right, so I shall hit the button. Through the years, we have watched our cars become more and more advanced, but many of the features that were built into these older cars are ones we remember fondly. Learning how to drive and getting your very first car was a big deal, and that's why it's sad to think about the changes. This video the revisits some of my older Moon videos, compiling them into a longer, more comprehensive presentation. So please enjoy this compilation of obsolete car features from the past. Yeah, look at that. Well, I mean, that's just a styling of the car. You got yacht size, the engine's bigger than you are. Yeah. <laughs> you have room to work in. <laughs> well, mo most of that is, you know, crash zone. <laughs> yeah. You know, because I, I think they, I think Jeremy Clarkson said it once. Um, it's kind of like, yes, at some point, Americans decided that cars needed to be bigger. So they just made them bigger. Yeah. There's nothing in there. You know, you you open up the um, the hood, and it's kind of like the engine's still the same size. <laughs> they just made it bigger. Yeah, yeah more space, and yeah. the trunks, you know, good size to sneak people into the drive through. Yeah. Well, yes, that's true. Yeah, if you can't fit several people into the trunk, the trunk is too small. <laughs> yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Pop-up headlights were most commonly found on sports cars, but Honda also liked to add them to their models. These headlights could flip up and down and were concealed when they were turned off. These type of lights date back to the 1930s, but vehicle light regulations changed over time. And by the 1990s, the pop-up headlight was facing extinction due to safety issues. Because of this, manufacturers phased out this light configuration which would disappear altogether in 2004. Yeah, Trisha's Ford Probes. Oh, well, mine did. Which car did it? Was it my... Firebird. Firebird, yeah. Yeah, the Firebird had pop-up headlights. I know there's a whole bunch of Porsches that actually used to have pop-up headlights. They were actually... I liked them, but they you got, they would get stuck and stuff. Yeah, that's the, that was the main safety problem with them yeah. when they started to mess up. Yeah, because I know Porsches were hydraulic. Um, so that had its own little pile of problems. Uh, Lincolns used to have them, or a variation. Lincolns used to have doors. Yeah, They'd have the uh, door that yeah. would pull back. 
um, over the headlights, which actually it still looks, it's, it's a cool looking feature. Um, yeah, uh, like a lot of GMs, you yeah, would have the pop up on the electric motor, which, you know, plastic gears would break. So it would go, clunk. <laughs> or just not go up at all, yeah. yeah. The appeal of automatic seatbelts is unknown, but a lot of compact cars made in the 1980s had this feature. If you remember getting into an older Honda Civic or Honda Accord, you probably remember the seatbelts sliding back across your shoulder. The concept was that the driver and passenger would not need to remember to put on their seatbelt because the car took care of that for you. Although intentions were good, these seatbelts required you to manually buckle the lap belt, which many people failed to do. The seatbelt motors would also often burn out or get stuck, making buckling up nearly impossible. So by the early 1990s, this feature had been abandoned completely. Yeah, I almost, I got, um, well, I shouldn't say killed, <laughs> but it's like. You I, were killed? No, almost oh killed. God. Almost Penny. killed. Penny. Yeah, it almost <laughs> choked me because I got into, and there again, it, was <laughs> it, my, it was my sister's car. car. It was the probe, and it? Which was in the early 90s. It was one of the last cars that I actually had. Yeah, it, it went back. That was when I was working at Pizza Hut. It went back and it jammed. Yeah. And you know, seatbelts how they don't come up once they go. Yeah, once they it once kept, the, uh, it kept pulling, and I think that's what happened. It got jammed and it was coming out the side, mm -hmm. so it kept pulling on. And I kept having and it was going across my neck, and I couldn't reach back to because there was an, a latch. Yeah, the, and I the couldn't latch up yeah, there. Yeah. I couldn't reach back to unlatch it. And then the seat, everyone's like, "Well, just recline your seat." It's like you couldn't recline your seat because your seat had to go forward a little bit yeah. before it reclined. So I'm like sitting there honking my horn because they were getting on that pizza and trying to get my someone, I think it was my manager because it was probably during the day. It was probably just the two of us in there to like come out. It's like this the car's seatbelt like literally trying to kill me. <laughs> and it did. It left a pretty good bruise across my, mm -hmm. you know, neck shoulder. Could just open the door. My shoulder. It, yeah, but it did, but it didn't go back up because it was oh. jammed. And then the whole, oh, like, uh, yeah. the whole wire and everything popped down because then we had to take it and get it fixed. Fixed. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know what it just. Anyway, yeah, cars. Car buyers used to complain about their antennas getting either stolen or damaged at the car wash. Mm -hmm. So automakers decided to solve this problem by introducing power antennas. These were used on cars well into the early 2000s, and there were a lot of benefits to a power antenna. But the drawback was that the antenna became more complicated to replace or repair, and could cost hundreds of dollars. Fortunately, over time, automakers figured out how to incorporate the antenna into the design of the car, and the power antenna became a thing of the past. Yeah, because people go around and break them. That's why you had them go down. Yeah. But, or steal them, uh, you know, like on the truck, because you know, our, our truck, which still has an old style of antenna on it, all you got to do is just kind of like spin it a few times and just kind of, yeah. hey, antenna. And now they're just, they're just like the little like, black things on the back. Yeah, often in the rear windows. Yeah. Vent windows allowed passengers in a car to push out a little piece of triangular glass to let in some fresh air. Was this smoking. was an essential design feature considering most cars in the first half of the 20th century didn't have air conditioning. Even during the 1950s, air conditioning was reserved for the most luxurious cars. Vent windows showed up less and less as AC became cheaper and eventually standard in vehicles. Some of the very last vehicles to have this feature were the Ford F-150s and Dodge Rams from 1996. Ours doesn't. Yeah, it isn't ours in 95. No, it's 96. No, it's 96. Yeah, but but it's one of the big ones, so. Yeah, I wish I owned one. Well, it doesn't matter now because I don't smoke anymore, but. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, but it, it's a feature that I think should come back because, you know, it's using the AC just kind of drags on the engine, especially or drains on the battery these days. If you're you know running running an electric car, having that ability to just kind of like crack those vent windows open because those vent windows 
you know, affect your economy a lot less than actually rolling the window down. Yeah. You know, having that ability to just crack that open to the air in would, you know, save on battery and fuel. At the time, Landau roofs were considered the pinnacle of American luxury. These sometimes vinyl roofs were meant to look like a convertible, and they were named after a horse-drawn carriage that came from Landau, Germany. The only problem was that these roofs would deteriorate and eventually fall apart. Replacing the vinyl could be an expensive proposition and not something that many people wanted to deal with. This style of roof fell out of style by the 1990s, although occasionally you still might find a Landau roof on a new Cadillac. They also suck because you get small holes in them, water gets underneath, and the roof rusts. Well, our thing, ours, my mom's, um, like, got old, and then I think yeah. I got hit by hail, and so I think, yeah, so we just ended up just ripping, ripping it off. It off. Yeah. That. Which, yeah, when it starts getting old and damaged, that's kind of the best thing you can do, because, mm. when it, yeah, when it gets damaged, water gets underneath it, well, and the roof is still metal. So, you know, the water just sits in there yes i think sits in there and steams it was a chevy i think the whole roof and down was was it but then she had an osmobile cutlass which i think was just like that Mm. i don't think we ever had any issues with that one heavily influenced by the movie smoky and the bandit and the fact that cell phones were non-existent some cars in the 1980s had the option to come with a cb radio The CB radio made two-way communication between cars really convenient, but the fad seemed to die off pretty quickly as cell phones became universally accepted. CBs are still around though, and many enthusiasts, truckers, and emergency responders continue to use the device, and it seems that some reliable technologies, like CB radios, never quite go out of style. While General Motors was responsible for creating the removable T-top roof design, many other automakers adopted it. T-tops were an iconic part of the 1970s and 1980s. The issue was that there were a lot of safety problems that T-tops had. The first and foremost was the structural safety of the car, which was compromised by T-tops. Then you had the leaking roofs, and even damage to the T-tops caused by improper storage of the glass panels. In the end, automakers dropped this concept altogether, although GM offered them as an option on some models up until 2002. I liked them, and then didn't like them at the same time. I liked them because it's kind of like, yeah, it's neat, but they were a faff. Because, yeah, when you had yours... It was rare that we took them out because, you know, the, there was like a special place that they locked in the trunk. But if you had stuff in the trunk, then you couldn't put them in the trunk. Yeah. And kind of like, I mean, you could sort of stuff them behind the seat, but yeah, that I wasn't mean, the safest thing yeah. to do because it is a big glass panel, basically, with a locking mechanism attached. But it was just kind of nice to have like just the center of part of it though. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, I, don't, I very seldom take it out. Because yeah. But then it's kind of like, it, it's almost a case of yeah, you, you might as well just have a sunroof though. Yeah. Or a convertible. Like most features of early American cars, front <laughs> bench seating was a holdover from the horse-drawn carriage. Allowing for extra passengers, or just to give everybody a little more room, the bench seat was a popular feature of the big American sedan. Safety regulations in the 1970s led to the bench seat declining in popularity, but they remained in many trucks. The introduction of the center console meant that many new cars simply didn't have the space. But if you were a kid in the 1970s and 80s, there is no doubt you rode around on that front bench seat. The Crown Victoria was one of the last modern sedans to offer bench seating. Other than that, bench seats and sedans were abandoned altogether. Yeah, because like, um, growing up, like if it was just two of us going with my mom somewhere, we both sat in the front seat. Oh, yeah. Now, and it was... There, There were occasions that it never made sense to me. One of those occasions was if the vehicle had a floor shifter. Trucks were notorious for this. 
um, your older trucks. Yeah, we have a front bench, you know, a front bench seat or just a bench seat, and that was it. So you can fit three people or four if you squeeze in your truck, but it has a floor shifter in it, which yeah, means that, that someone middle, is always was... straddling yeah. the gear shift. Some, sometimes getting hit in places. <laughs> yeah, because because so. especially trucks, those shifters like would go down to basically the, yeah the, almost to the seat. Yeah, to the seat and. When yeah, you're trying it, was, to shift it was. It was one of those. It was one of those things them. that, <laughs> at times, it just made no yeah. sense to me. As automakers worked to improve the interior quality of their vehicles, velour seats became very popular. These I seating options interior. were meant to be more. I hate red interior when it's eighteen different shades of red. Yeah, like. This one, the steering wheel is one color of red, the armrest is another color of red, the door panel is another color of red, the seat is another color of red. If it is one uniform red, it can look really good. Yeah. Unfortunately, they normally not, because the plastic's one color, this plastic's another color, the seat's going to be another color, the carpet's going to be a different color from the seat. It just becomes this kind of weird burgundy mess. Yeah. Comfortable and luxurious, and they could be found in all kinds of cars, from Hondas to Cadillacs. The only problem was that these seats would make you sweat. For long summer trips, velour seating wasn't ideal. In addition to that, they also didn't hold up very well, breaking down and becoming flat within a couple years. Chrysler ended up using velour seating up until the 1990s, but for most, it was a relic left in the 1980s. Remember car seats that had button tufting? These were ultra comfortable seats that made cars feel even more luxurious. This type of seating was often included on lower trim levels, which GM was notorious for doing. Chrysler was one of the last automakers to offer this in their K-Car interiors. Over the years, button tufting became just a fad that could often be found in the lowriders that were cruising the main streets of America. Nowadays, seating is more comfortable than ever, and leather is now the go-to upholstery for the car industry. I know. I don't like leather because it's... To me, it's more of a faff to take care of because you do have to take care of it. Because if you don't, you know, treat it and stuff moderately regularly, especially if you're in a hot climate. If you don't treat it and stuff moderately regularly, then it starts to crack. Once it starts to crack, it starts to break down, yeah. and then you just have more of a mess. It's also you stick to it. Yeah, I mean, it's okay now well, because they have the seat warmers. Well, you have but the, 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 you've got the seats in both directions. They that you've got heated seats and you've got cooling seats. Yeah. So do they have cooling? Yeah, seats they actually or? have cooling seats now as well. So. You know, yeah. that helps, but you can also do the same exact thing with a fabric seat. So, yeah. but yeah, pr pr prior to that, it's like, yeah, it's like if you they're cold, cold in the winter and you stick yeah. to them in the summer, like especially if you're wearing shorts, you get out of the car, it's like, <laughs> and you just ripped off a layer of skin off your leg. <laughs> you peel yourself out yeah. of the car, and your seat was now filthy because you know, there's a layer of skin stuck to it. Yeah. The visual of a family going on vacation in a wood-paneled station wagon wasn't just in the movies. Many car models came with fake wood panels along the sides. While this wasn't bad looking at the time, it was cheaply made, causing the paneling to fall off or disintegrate. Many different cars used this wood paneling, with Chrysler being one of the last companies to offer it on the town and country minivan up until 1996. Today, like wood that. paneling looks Same great color. on vintage vehicles and is a reminder of those family road trips in the family station wagon. Yeah, about the only one that ever looked really good on was, um, what was it, the Woody, except those on the good ones were actually a wood veneer so it was a finished wood yeah and so this it, is it, like paper this is yeah this is just like like, you know, it's like plastic it's yeah. it's your cheap like you, it's your cheap you, furniture from target yeah. stuck yeah. on a car it doesn't say or your shelf like <laughs> yeah I mean, it is it's basically it's, it's shelf liner <laughs> stuck on the outside of the car it just saved on paint yeah. which is weird because you would have thought that would have been more expensive than paint back then Especially the way they did now cars. Now they have vinyl wrap as like a because they used now for cars. Yeah, because they used to just dip the car 
Vinyl wrap is great on new cars because, you know, it's kind of like you want weird outlandish graphics and stuff on your car. You throw a wrap on it. It costs less than paint, a lot less than paint now. And when you want to sell your car, because you haven't changed the color of your car, you don't have to change the title, you just peel the sticker off. Because if you repaint your car in wild and wacky colors, you have to have the title changed because the title has the color listed on it. If it's just a, if it's just a sticker on it, you don't have to do any of that. Uh, that's what I was going to do with my um, Mustang. Yeah, it was black and it got hell damage, and I wanted it painted like pearl color, and I wouldn't yeah. have to change the title and everything. So, yeah, and I was like, yeah, I ain't gonna go through all that. Mm -mm. <laughs> just paint it black again. <laughs> It's hard to find a car or truck today that has this in between the front seats. For many of us, we first learned how to drive by pushing in the clutch and shifting the stick into yep. gear. Manual transmissions, just like many things, have disappeared because of convenience, and they have been slowly replaced with automatic transmissions that do the job of changing gears for you. Unless you are driving an older model vehicle or a sports car, it's probably been a while since you've driven a four, five, or six speed stick shift. But there is no doubt you remember learning how to drive that very first car. Yeah, I think there is, uh, there's only a handful left on the market in America that you can order. Not just walk into a dealership, you're probably going to have to order it with a stick shift. I think Ford has, I think the Ford Bronco, I think you can. And the Ford Mustang, I know you can. I know you can get the Mustang with a stick. Well, that was um, the last stick I had, it was my second yeah. Mustang I had. But most, most old cars, yeah, you, there's, there's simply not even an option. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think there's less than 10 total vehicles on the market. Well, now you used to be, that used to be um, I trucks. think I mentioned this in another one where there is, um, I know, like, when I was... Or even column shifter. You know, column shifters are even older. Like, the, yeah, the 80s and the 90s, it was like, yeah, you used to always have to pay attention when cars were for sale, whether or not it was... A stick or an automatic mm -hmm. and stuff, and it's like you go. It's like, oh, I don't want a stick, or I only want to see. You know, that was a big. Well, and with older, to... with the older ones, uh, with the column shift, you had to pay attention with the column shift even more because mm -hmm. that column shift. Yeah, people nowadays know it as an automatic thing, but you go yeah. back in the day and you had stick shifts on the column, mm -hmm. so it was still a three pedal with a clutch and everything, yeah. but it was on the column, not on the floor. Mm -hmm. And you see, you see it, you see it on there, and you think it's it, it yeah. Isn't. You think it's an automatic, and yeah. it wasn't. It was a stick. Back when just about everyone smoked cigarettes, cars came equipped with cigarette lighters in the front and back seat. These lighters could be pushed in, and they would heat up. Then, after a few seconds, they would pop out to let you know they were ready to use. Today, these sockets have been repurposed into electrical outlets used for auxiliary DC power, mm -hmm. which charges phones and other electronics in the car. If you had a car with push-in cigarette lighters, then there is no doubt that car had ashtrays installed in it. The front dash usually had a nice big ashtray that slid out like a drawer. If you weren't using the little vent window on the door to flick your cigarettes, then the ashtray was the next best thing. For those that didn't smoke, these ashtrays were used to hold change. The back seats also had access to ashtrays, but these were usually small flip-out ones that were either in the door or mounted on the back of the front seat. I forgot about them like that. Um, and I had one on each side, too. Yeah. Yeah, usually, if car, sometimes they still come with the option. Uh, you can select having a smoker's package Although if you do, if the car has a cup holder, the cup holder tends to go away because that becomes an ashtray. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do with. I think it was my had to be my second Mustang. My uh, first Mustang had to have had an ashtray. Yeah, I didn't get yeah, that. Was I didn't the, get the cup holder ashtray until I got the second Mustang. Yeah, it was the second Mustang. Remember rich Corinthian leather? This was a new name that Chrysler came up with to make you think that the interiors were nicer than they actually were. Ricardo Montalban was the pitch man, and his accent, along with the exotic word Corinthian, made people think they were getting the most luxurious and rich leather on the planet, when in reality, it was just the same leather found in other vehicles. 
The advertising campaign was a memorable one though, lasting from the mid-1970s through the 1980s. Mm -hmm. There was a time when three-speed manual transmissions were controlled by a shifter attached to the steering column. This became known as three on the tree, and many student drivers learned to drive using this column shifter. The gear shifter mounted on the steering column was common from the 1940s through the 1970s, and the term three on the tree was countered by four on the floor, which meant that a four-speed gear shifter could also be mounted to the floor of the car. I've only seen maybe one or two of those, someone having them. Um, I've never seen one in person, but I've seen a yeah, lot I of them because I watch I a lot of car restoration yeah, stuff. I think I was like maybe, I would say I was probably in high school, I never even yeah. knew. I've, I've seen trucks. They were like that. But trucks and cars. Yeah. Instantly, isn't the speedo on that awesome? I love those kind of like arching horizon mm -hmm. and horizontal speedo. Anyway. <clears throat> Manual might be the best way to describe automobiles prior to the 1990s. Even the windows rolled up and down by cranking a handle in one direction or another. This was also true with door locks. They had to be pulled up or down to lock or unlock a car door. Push button automation has become the norm now, but the days of having more reliable and less complicated systems for operating a vehicle are something that many of us miss about the older generations of cars. Yeah. Oh, yeah, with the handle, you can yeah. um, to pull back. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, if you had automatic windows, yeah. you were considered rich. <laughs> like... Yeah. Yeah, there, there's still some cheap, shall we say, car manufacturers in um, Europe that still produce cars that, you know, the bottom spec car actually still has manual windows. <laughs> manual windows... No automatic. You know, there's, you know, but then there's, there's a, you know, there's a lot of times where it's kind of like, yeah, do you need half of the features that come with a car? It's kind of like, especially today when you look at prices, it's kind of like, yeah, could I have a cheaper car that doesn't have all of these features that I just don't really need? Yeah. But if I need to wind the window down, AC is nice. We live in a climate where you have to have AC, um, but. Yeah, you know, if I need to roll the window down, I can roll the window down. Because, again, kind of like with AC, don't need the electrics. But also from a safety standpoint, that's just better. You're in an accident. Oh, the electrics don't work. I can't roll the window down, but I could reach this handle and just go, <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. and now my window's going down. I can get out of the vehicle. Just one of those... Doesn't it make... Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever turned your high beams on by stepping on a switch that was mounted on the floor? Before the switch was integrated into the steering column, high beams were operated with your left foot. These buttons could be found in cars into the 1980s, but they slowly began to disappear because the switches would get jammed up with dirt or accidentally turned on because your foot would wander. All of us have fond memories of riding in the back of station wagons. The rear-facing seat in the way, way back was always the best seat in the car. From here, you could see all of the other cars behind you, and it made for some fun to wave and make faces at the other cars driving by. This seat could also be folded away to give you trunk space for all the groceries, too. Car radios have evolved over the years, from AM-FM radios to 8-track and cassette tapes. But in the 1990s, you began to see aftermarket radios being sold that had a detachable face. This so was a time when car radios yeah. and speaker systems were popular with thieves. And so the idea of removing the faceplate provided extra protection against your car getting broken into. But let's face it, most of us never removed the face because it was a hassle to carry around. Box. You just throw it in the glove box. Actually, it's still there. Yeah. And being honest, it's still there. Yeah, in the truck. Well, the truck has a 95 or 96. So. Yeah, it's 96. And it, ha it came with the aftermarket radio installed. They used to have it where the whole radio 
pulled that's yes. what that was before that the whole radio pulled out and you had yeah. to carry that which and was then they changed really it dumb. to just do the huh? mm. which was really dumb yeah and then they changed it to where you just, yeah, just pop the face off yeah car keys are another thing that have changed drastically over the years it used to be that when you bought a car, you received two keys. One was a round key that opened and locked the doors, while the other key was square and operated the ignition. General Motors was especially known for having two keys, and they even resisted switching over to just one key for the longest time. Today we have remote control key fobs that operate everything on a car, so the jingle of keys in your pocket is another thing you rarely hear anymore. The wheels of a car have undergone changes through the years, too. Tires used to be fashionable with wide white walls that were ultra popular in the 1950s. These tires looked great, but were tough to keep clean. But nonetheless, they were still offered as an option on cars as the decades passed. Hubcaps were also something we used to see covering the lug nuts of a wheel. This protected them from dirt and grime, but also became a decorative accent on many cars. Lastly, there was a time when cars used to come with a full-size spare in the trunk. As cars have become smaller and space in the trunk limited, cars today are outfitted with a small donut tire that is only meant for temporary use. If there's one at all. Mm -hmm. That's something else you have to watch now when you're buying. Mm -hmm. I think more than 50% of cars on the market now do not have a spare. Unless you select that as an option. It's an option that you have to pick to actually get a spare tire for your vehicle. And you're probably spending like 500 bucks or two. Probably. <laughs> more, more than it's worth, that's, yeah. that's for sure. As I said earlier, radios have evolved. We have seen them go from just a radio to having the latest portable music technology. 8-track tape players were the first. Then they became compact cassette tapes. Then CD players were introduced, which offered superior sound. Now all of these are gone, and we are left with Bluetooth technology that connects to our phone and plays anything you could ever want. But there was something special about having those old features that remind us of our younger years. <coughs> yeah, and um, yeah, with the CDs, you ended up with the big, the big changes in the trunk of the car. They could, you know, have anywhere from five to a hundred CDs yeah. in the big changer in the trunk, mm -hmm. and just, you know, yeah, I got my entire CD collection here. What do you want in my home? Oh. Yeah, I bought two copies of everything. Yeah, I guess I don't know. Gas in the back. Filling up your car with gas is something that we all are familiar with, but knowing where the gas cap is used to be a little more tricky. The fuel tanks in older cars were in different locations. Therefore, the gas cap could be on the right or left side of the car, or even behind the rear license plate. You would have to flip down the license plate to find it, which made for a funny scene in National Lampoon's Vacation, as Clark tried to gas up the family truckster. I think they should still be like that. That way you don't have to be on a specific side when you go get gas. <laughs> yeah, that is true. And then you start throwing in trucks as well, because trucks used to, it used to be, um, in old trucks, it used to be right behind the seat was where the gas tanks were. If you lean the foot, the seat forward, the gas tank would be all the way across along behind the bench seating, hmm. um, which was also deemed, you know, unsafe-ish, which is why it's now slung below the fuel rails. The hood of cars used to be adorned with a fancy ornament that let you know what make of car it was. These mini metal sculptures looked like they were in motion, even when standing still. But eventually they became a safety issue for pedestrians. The fixed mounted ornaments first became spring loaded. Then car makers began to use logo emblems that laid flat on the hood. And now many of them are just incorporated into the front grille of the car. There's still a few that haven't. Is that it? Mm -hmm. we, we ran that video into a <coughs> long destination. So, <laughs> so hopefully you're still with us. Well, yeah, I know Rolls Royce still has um, 
it still has its figurine, although it now automatically retracts. Yeah. Um, which is more of a theft problem thing. Yeah. But. yeah. I think because like Mercedes, I think was the same, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mer- uh, Mercedes. Was still yeah, in. Mercedes used to have the um, their little leech logo, um, and then yeah, they became spring loaded. So if you hit them, you could you could walk along and flick Mercedes logos on the car and you go boing. <clears throat> no. Well, that was interesting. Mm-hmm. And we're obviously going to hit this guy's channel up some more. Oh yeah. So make sure you hit that like and subscribe. Uh, leave comments down below with suggestions and requests and hit the notification bell so you know when new videos are released. And until next time, thanks for watching.